Good morning. It's wonderful to be here, and thank you for joining us. I drove here from Cleveland, where I am the book review editor, and I was um, delighted to be occupied with a complex subject and an engaging biographer. Deborah Baker seems allergic to the facile answer and drawn to lives that are complicated and eliciting more questions than answers. So if that is your cup of tea, you've walked into the right room. Because Margaret Marcus, who became Maryam Jamala, is so complicated, I thought the respectful and interesting thing to do would be to begin with some of her words. So we're going to ask Deborah Baker to read for us. Hi, thank you all for coming. It's great to be in Chicago. I love this city so much, um, and especially on such a beautiful day. Just a brief thing before I read from this. Um, this is a letter that Mariam Jamila um, wrote to her parents on, uh, act, uh, on, the, on, on board the ship, a, G, a Greek crater that was taking her from Brooklyn, New York to um, Karachi, Pakistan, and from there she would move to Lahore. Um, uh, basically, uh, the, the, these were, this was the first of the letters that I found at the New York Public Library, which was my introduction to um, Margaret Marcus, Mariam Jamila. May 1962, the Hellenic Torch. This was posted from Alexandria, Egypt. After all our goodbyes, after you, Mother, Betty, and Walter walked down the gangplank and drove off, I was overcome by a profound sense of dread. I stood at the deck rail for a long time, completely stricken, the excitement of the weeks leading up to my departure gone. When the ship finally pulled away from the Brooklyn Pier, the lights of the city began to dim and the engine seemed to echo the pounding of my heart. A black and fathomless ocean was slowly swallowing everything I had ever known. It took some time and many prayers before my fear began to subside. Um, so she goes on to, just to tell her parents about the various odd characters on board. Um, and you know, uh, there's a, a captain and his Greek crew who were very um, suspicious of, of, her, of her, her, this journey that she was making to um, Pakistan. Mother, you imagined I was going to need my nice silk dress for dining and dancing on board as if my passage had been booked on a cruise ship instead of a cheap Greek crater. I was happy to leave that dress behind with Betty, her sister, along with my girdle and corset, and my high heels I gave to the colored lady who lived in the room across from mine at Martha Jeffer Women's Residence. Dressed now in my hand-sewn, ankle-length, dirndl skirt and high-neck, long sleeve blouse, I certainly see that I I certainly see that I cut an unlikely figure. Anyone might well ask, why would an otherwise attractive Western woman insist on dressing in such a manner? Honestly, I don't blame him. Then, the captain tells me that he's just returned from Turkey. Despite Mustafa Kemal's Ataturk best efforts to persecute Muslims by outlawing polygamy, the Hajj, and the Arabic script, it seems that the captain found no dearth of religious fanatics. I asked him what he meant by religious fanatic. Muslims who refuse to eat pork for fear of hell, he informed me. Muslims who avoid non-Muslims like the plague. He would be perfectly happy to see the Muslim religion eradicated, he said, because everyone knows Western civilization is superior. While Istanbul and Ankara are fairly westernized and home to many Europeans, he assured me that the rest of Turkey was as backward and reactionary as ever. A young Greek sailor chimed in, you'll see for yourself the filth and poverty of the Arabs when you get there. So there you have it. You have a 27-year-old woman who grew up on Long Island throwing it all off to get on this ship and join a foster father she's never met in her pursuit of holiness, in her longing for community. And yesterday, Louis Uria was speaking about his own ancestor who was a healer in 19th century Mexico, and he spoke of the catastrophe of holiness. And that phrase stuck to my ribs because of the difficulty of someone who 
moves against what they've been given in their religious pursuit. Can you talk to us a little, Deborah, about what grabbed you in the letters with this voice and this profoundly unorthodox quest? Well, um, you know, you've, you've heard a little bit of her voice, and um, I, just, I just was so struck by the sharpness and the clarity and the sort of enthusiasm of it. It was like, um, uh, you know, reading some person who's like going to Europe for the first time and everything's new and every, she wants to write down absolutely everything she sees and convey the excitement of this journey to her parents. And in the back of my mind, even though I'm reading these letters, you know, with great excitement, this was like in the spring of 2007 when I first sort of stumbled upon them completely by chance, I thought, this is not going to end well. You, know, you just have the sense that this woman has no idea what she's sailing off into the wild blue yonder towards. And you know, just like that Greek shipmate, you know, you know, you'll see for yourself. You know, that kind of that that's sort of in the back of my mind. But I can't sort of tear myself away from these letters. So that's sort of how I begin the book: is that I involve the reader in this sort of discovery, and um, you know, this the sense of, you know, well, what's going to happen next? So we have a thorny detective question in, the, in this woman. And one of the things I was thinking about as I read was an observation Martin Marty made. He's a Lutheran theologian. I admire that one can't have a conversation with anyone unless one knows the places from which they view the world. And as a journalist, I thought, bingo, you know, what have I been doing as an interviewer? It's partly the homework of trying to figure out the vantage points one brings to their view of the world. Can you talk, Deborah, a little bit about the foundational vantage points of um, Maryam and also your own? Sure. Well, Maryam grew up Peggy Marcus in, um, actually in Westchester, New York, uh, large Mamaronic, New York, um, and a sort of bedroom community of New York City. Um, her parents were secular Jews, um, they, but they celebrated Christmas and Easter. She loved Christmas music. She loved classical music, um, Easter baskets, the whole thing, and she didn't even really quite understand that she was a Jew until she was sort of in kindergarten and she began, you know, the, the sort of playground taunts um, from sort of Catholic school children began. They began. They threw rocks at her, they called her, you know, Christ killer, the usual um, anti-Semitism. And so, you know, she, she began to, well, you know, what is this, what is it, uh, this Judaism? And so her parents ended up sending her to Temple, to Hebrew school. And she was fascinated by um, these stories and the stories of, you know, her ancestors living in land, uh, you know, these biblical lands and, and, you know, and it made them seem so much more exciting than the Jews that she was growing up around. You know, she was shunned by the Orthodox Jews in her immediate community because she lived in an unkosher household. So she was sort of surrounded by all these sort of tribal divisions and then but in Bible school, she was sort of looking at the Jews and Arabs living side by side, you know, harmoniously, and it just seemed, you know, very simple, desert, tribal community, very, um, and, and, and it sort of excited her imagination. Um, and she was born in 1934, so she came of age during the Second World War. She, um, you know, hit adolescence, you know, right at that moment when, you know, um, you know, everyone was was learning about what had happened, you know, in Eastern Europe to the Jews, and you know, this was she was she was a kind of child, very precocious child who read the papers religiously every day, and there was this sense that something was going on, but no one really quite believed it. And then when the photographs started being published, her, first her parents tried to hide it because she was a very she was a child sort of constantly questioning, well, why is this? Why is that? Why is this? And her parents just didn't know how to answer these questions. So, you know, she was completely traumatized by that. Um, and then, you know, when it, you know, the Jews were all of a sudden going to, you know, to start this state of, of Israel, she was very excited, initially very excited. She thought, oh, the Jews are, you know, we're going to reconnect with our roots. and 
we're going to learn how to be real Jews again. That was the word she used. And, um, and the Arabs are going to protect us from the horrible Christians. And, um, you know, that was, and then when she saw that that was not how the state of Israel was unfolding, that was sort of the beginning of her move, you know, to, uh, to her radicalization, her, 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 you know, in sympathy, she moved towards the Arabs, towards, she'd always sort of um, been fascinated by Arab poetry, by Arab music, you know, f um, and at least from the age of 10 onwards, and um, she just sort of got drawn further and further, and her parents would say, oh no, the Arabs, they're killing the Jews, you, you know, they're dirty, low people, and she would sort of, you know, want to believe that and she would destroy, she liked to paint, she would destroy her drawings, but then she just wanted to prove to her parents that they were prejudiced, you know, that it was bad, she knew that it was bad to be prejudiced against black people, so she felt like, you know, she wanted to argue her parents that, you know, the Arabs are a great people, that, um, you know, and so there was this tension in the household, you know, in her, in her you know, at the center of her life, in the center of her adolescence. So that's sort of her framework, where she was coming out of. As far as my framework, which I'm generally not very interested in because I'm a biographer, and a biographer, is t you tend to stay, you know, behind the curtain, you know, pay no attention to the person behind the curtain. But, you know, my framework was, um, you know, I just, I discovered these letters. Um, I'd written mostly about, you know, obscure American poets before that. I'd never written about a sort of Islamic ideologue, which is what she eventually became. And, um, you know, I was completely obsessed with them, and, and really no one seemed to really understand the nature of my obsession, so I had to keep wondering, like, well, what is it? Why is it that this is, these letters are speaking so much to me? And I'd read her books. She later became this, the voice of Islam's argument with the West. So, you know, uh, you know and she, she was compl very influential and a big name in the Islamic world, as was her adopted father. But, um, you know, so I felt like these uh, issues, you know, and I was, you know, writing and researching this book in the midst of, you know, the war on terror, and also in New York City, where, you know, I had, you know, um, you know, witnessed the 9/11 attacks, um, you know, in 2001. So I was sort of torn. You know, the idea of objectivity really never entered into it because, on the one hand, I had been traumatized deeply and personally affected by the 9/11 attacks, but on the other hand, you know, I had seen this country that I loved, you know, become this sort of, you know, um, uh, you know, betray its most sort of sacred laws in pursuit of, you know, a war against, you know, Muslim people that really had nothing to do with the attacks. So. So I was sort of, you know, the deeper I got into Mariam Jamila's life and into this story, the more it became apparent that there were these elephants in the room that I couldn't just pretend weren't there. So that was a, it's a long answer to your question. But. It's, a, it's a great answer, and it seems that both for you and for Margaret Marcus, the book is an indispensable key to the formation of one's view of the world in the sense that for little Margaret, Peggy, the road to Mecca, a book by a Jew who converted, right. was a, a foundational document for her. Yes. Can you talk just briefly about her autodidacticism and that particular book? Yeah, this was a book called The Road to Mecca, which has been the road to Mecca for a lot of people who've read it. It's a, it's a memoir by this uh, Austrian Jew who was a journalist who went to um, cover uh, North Africa and the Middle East and became very friendly. He traveled a lot in the desert um, with a trusty Bedouin guide um, and, you know, just wrote this very passionate, wonderful book about, about uh, Ara Arabia. And he became very good friends with King Saud and later on uh, married a Bedouin woman and then moved to Pakistan and became Pakistan's ambassador to America. And But, you know, Mariam just her, her parents refused to let her take this book home, so she would just go to the library after school and, you know, read it a dozen times. And I later met Muhammad Assad's son, who teaches in New York City, and he says, you know, he gets so many letters from people, 
you know, looking to him for guidance, you know, because they've read his father's book. Um, so that was her, that was wonderful. But she also listened to Um Kutum, who was this great Egyptian singer. Um, she would play her records, you know, at top volume, you know, with all the windows of her parents' apartment opening, open, so she could watch people's, you know, expressions on, in the suburban lawn below. But, uh, so she had this kind of uncanny fascination and obsession with um, Arab culture, um, you know, Middle Eastern culture. So Deborah paints a picture of this precocious child who is swimming against the tide, alive with ideas, and is misfit to the place and time she finds herself to such a painful degree that she herself describes a friendless, isolated, bookish environment in her parents' home. She's thrown out of two colleges. We're not quite sure why. She is stuck and unhappy. And through the letters and through Deborah's writing, we readers become anxious to know what will become of this woman child who's launched herself in such an unorthodox direction on this freighter. And one of the um, great through lines of the convert are the letters, but one of the confounding parts is Deborah treats us as, as grown-ups and lets us experience her difficulty in trying to discern this woman and tells us that these letters aren't straight stenography, that Deborah herself has made them more concise, moved a few anecdotes around. So then there's a hole blown into the book. What are we to be made of this document that isn't quite what we would assume as we began? I'd like you to try to tell us why you made the choice to reconstitute the mm -hmm. letters. Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, I'd like to say the book is divided into three parts. The first part is called the Marble Library, which is the library where I found the letters. That's the New York Public Library. And that really, tell, that really tells the story of the first 24 letters, which were her first 18 months in Pakistan, You know, which began on the Greek ship and sort of ended with uh, this letter that all of a sudden is being written from an insane asylum in Lahore. And when I got to that letter, I thought, oh my God, you know, I've been like just not thinking twice, just, you know, going down the, you know, she's just going down the garden path with her and not thinking at all about whether or not what she's writing in the letter is, is unreliable or not. So when I got to that letter, I thought, okay. And then the next letter said, you know, well, now I guess I really have to tell you what really happened to me when I got to Pakistan. This is, again, letters to her parents. So I thought, you know, I'm gonna, so she's going to start at the beginning and tell the story all over again. And I thought, you know, that's not really where the story starts, you know, what happened when she really got to Pakistan. And I don't know the terms under which this new letter was written, so that's when I go back to her childhood. And the whole second part of the book is her childhood. And then the, the third part sort of picks up with the first part ends with, you know, um, with, you know, her being in this insane asylum and then, you know, t telling uh, what really happened. And the third part is also when I decide that all the answers to all these questions that I've been, you know, feeding the reader and asking myself in the course of this narrative cannot be answered in, by me just digging deeper and deeper into the library but I have to go to Pakistan. And one element of the story that I haven't really discussed so much is the man that, that asked, invited Maryam Jamil and Margaret Marcus to come live with him and his family in Pakistan. And this man is like, if, you know, what Gandhi was to India, this man was to Pakistan. So this was another question at the heart of the book. Why did this incredibly powerful Islamic political leader invite this Jewish girl that he'd been corresponding with for a year to live with him as his daughter. I mean, he already had nine children, you know, but he was inviting yet another woman to his house in Pakistan. So, you know, it's one thing to sort of go back and forth as to who Maryam Jamila is, but then you need the historical context. You know, what was, where was Pakistan at that time? 
And so in some ways this book um, is also a book about America and Pakistan, America and Islam. So, um, you know, I don't want to sort of lose sight of that, of that, of those um, aspects of the book um, in, 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 you know, in the fine grain, you know, talk about, because Maryam in some way is a vehicle for a lot of these sort of meditations. But as to um, the question of what I decided to do with her letters, I felt it was important for, to have Maryam as a vehicle um, to, for the reader to experience her letters um, you know, with immediacy in her own words rather than me paraphrasing them or um, you know, saying, you know, well, Miriam says that she graduated from high school in 1953, but actually it was 1952. I mean, I find that sort of correct, uh, correcting voice of the biographer is very a uh, distancing and I wanted the readers to feel about her the way I felt about her when I first started reading these letters you know to be completely sucked into her world and you know if I you know had said at, at the outset that um, you know that you know that she was institutionalized then you know people will just say oh she's she's crazy and um, not have to wrestle with the kinds of questions that a lot that her books raised and that her letters raised to her parents and because her letters were so long you know like t 10 single space typed pages you know with no typos or anything and never an ungrammatical sentence they just were the cleanest sentences um, you can conceive of you know I, I wanted to to capture her voice, but I didn't want the reader to have to read, you know, twenty, you know, ten single types of pages. So I compressed them a lot, and I, um, you know, I, 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 I want, I sort of condensed them and and took the essence of them. But I didn't make anything up. I didn't, you know, biographers, you know, conventionally they paraphrase, they put in their own words, and they try to capture the voice of the writer but you're not supposed to you're supposed to sort of neutralize it but I really wanted to keep the punchiness of her voice so I decided to do that and some people they get to the end of the book and they may feel like okay that was okay thing to do other people might feel that I was sort of being a little misleading but I really did want that sort of narrative propulsion in the, at the outset and did you hit upon this solution after Miriam gave you explicit permission to do this? No, no, I, I, I wrote the whole book before I asked her permission. So luckily she said yes. <laughs> <laughs> and that was another revelation is when I started the book, when I started um, writing it um, and thinking about how it was going to unfold, you know, when I thought I could just stay in the library and write it, it never occurred to me that she might still be alive. So I also withhold that information from the reader. It wasn't until I got to this part of the archive which had, she had been a painter and all of a sudden uh, there was this box of paintings from Pakistan that she'd sent because she wasn't supposed to do painting. Painting is considered forbidden in Islam or at least in that variety of Islam. Um, and she so secretly would send these paintings back to the New York Public Library and the last painting in the last box of her um, a portfolio was dated September 11th, 2001. So I thought, oh, well, she, if she was alive in September on September 11th, maybe she's alive in 2007. So I wrote wrote to her, and um, she wrote back. And so that's when I realized that I had to go to Pakistan. And is in a new terrain as a biographer with a living subject. And one cannot read The Convert without thinking about the biographer's art. And there's a beautiful passage in here that I wanted to share with you about that question. And this is in Deborah's voice. Anonymity is my vocation. I inhabit the lives of my subjects until I think like them. Behind the doors of my study, I wear them like a suit of out-of-date clothes, telling their stories, interpreting their dreams, mimicking their voices as I type. I find myself most susceptible to those tuned to an impossible pitch, poets and wild-eyed visionaries who live their lives close to the bone, haunting archives, 
reading letters composed in agony and journals thick with unspeakable thoughts, I sound the innermost chambers of unquiet souls, unearth dramas no one would ever think to make up. I think that's gorgeous. And I also think that's brave. And have you an insight as to why your body of work calls you to these kinds of voices? Well, it's a kind of vicarious existence. You know, some people read obsessively about celebrities, and I read <laughs> obsessively about sort of saints and poets and misfits of various stripes. And I do feel that, you know, they, you know, by getting close to them and they're sort of trying to, you know, vibrate close to God, that, you know, that's my way of trying to see what it feels like. Um, and but of course you know one that you know then you have to you know if you're a proper biographer you have to sort of or if you live enough in these heads you realize oh well this is kind of a blind spot isn't it that this person has or you know they become a little cramped after a while and so you get exasperated and you know like well can't they see this and can't they see that and you become all of a sudden this sort of you know rather sensorious person, you know, and you realize, you know, that, that the, the break is happening, it's like a relationship falling apart, but you're not supposed to express those kinds of exasperations, you're just supposed to sort of be very neutral and say, well, you know, you know, put it in historical context and all that stuff, and that's a very important part of being a biographer, but this book I just sort of felt like it needed, you know, something different to, to as a way of, you know, framing the story. I think that your crankiness at times with Miriam gives the reader permission to be a bit annoyed, his or herself. And my annoyance came in in the sense that she is a exceptionally astute critic of Western materialism. She's prescient. She's spot on in places. There's a reason that her propaganda and pamphleteering and critique moved people, and it isn't just didacticism. But what I found myself thinking about with the puzzle of her life is she got on that freighter before the second wave of feminism hit the United States, and that powerful critique of the way religion and the way um, societies put the lives together of half their populations seemed to be absent, in fact, in antagonism with the way Miriam came to view the world in her censorious disgust for sexuality, for women who, she was critical of Jackie Onassis touring Pakistan in her cute costumes with sleeveless, her sleeveless, sleeveless silk shirts. And yet, you know, Miriam's box of being an unmarried woman, which was intolerable to her foster father, cried out for some feminist critique. Did you have a parallel annoyance with her, or is that my <laughs> idiosyncrasy? Well, I mean, I thought it was like, you know, here she is, you know, embracing Perda with huge excitement. Um, you know, she sent this picture to her parents, you know, when soon after she arrived, you know, like, you know, you'll never recognize me as the same old Peggy, you know, look at me now, you know, these are the clothes I'm going to be wearing for the rest of my life. And I thought, like, yeah, how can you recognize anybody? <laughs> you know, why do you have your picture taken if you're not going to show your face? I mean, that, I, that just, like, sort of stopped me in my tracks. But I, and thinking about it, you thought, well, she grew up in Westchester, you know, all, she watched her sister, all her cousins getting married. You know, marriage, the idea of marriage, she was a little scared of, she was scared of boys, you know, but she wanted those things in a peculiar way. And, you know, she, if only just to be like, well-adjusted like her sister. So, um, you know, so she was torn, but she, it, it's, she had no facility with boys. So it, in a way, it was perfect. Also, she wasn't beautiful like her sister. She was, you know, rather ungainly. And, you know, she admitted that she had absolutely no charm whatsoever. You know, um, so, and she was very aware of her clumsiness. And, and so really, what, what did her future hold for her in America, you know? Um, and... And so it made sense that she would 
look, search out, um, you know, more traditional culture where it really didn't matter what you looked like, um, where women, you know, had a specific role to play. But on the other hand, she would go to Pakistan and she automatically assumed that because she was writing all these articles and being published in the Muslim press and because she was corresponding with Syed Qutb in his Egyptian prison and you know, Hassan al-Banna's you know, son-in-law and living in exile in Switzerland and with Maulana Maldudi, that you know, she was a voice that had to be reckoned with, that she was a voice of authority, even though she didn't speak Arabic, she didn't speak Urdu, she never had read the Quran in the original holy language. So, you know, but she still nonetheless arrived with a sense of her own importance, which I ascribe to as a kind of particularly American kind of disease, you know, that where you can go into another country and just tell them exactly how they can be good Muslims. <laughs> and so there was that sort of flip side of that, you know, which is why I was even more interested to know what did Maududi expect from her? What did he want from her? Did he want to use, use her as a proxy? Was he going to marry her? What does his wife think? What did his children think? You know, what, what, what were his intentions towards her? Um, did he want her to translate his books? So there were all these questions about, you know, how she was, and she, when she arrived in Pakistan, it, you know, she immediately started a, writing a column, she was interviewed, she was profiled. It was like a sensation, you know, here is this Westerner who's given up everything to come, you know, out of this sense of faith um, to live with us and to tell us that we're superior to the West. And, you know, so there was, there was all that going on. So that was an, another sort of question, series of questions that I had to kind of answer. But as far as feminism, and you know, you know, when she was writing books in the um, early 60s through the 70s to the mid 80s, and when she began, because her mother would send her books, she would write to her mother and say, you know, can you send me this book? Can you send me that book? So she became quite interested in the women's live movement, and of course, she turned around and started publishing books, you know, denouncing women's liberation as, you know, the final destruct, the, 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 the thing that's going to lead to the end of Western civilization. Um, Milana Maldudi also believed that, you know, women's, the more freedoms women get, you know, is intimately allied with the fate of a civilization and it was, you know, destined to um, collapse, you know, soon after women were, you know, sort of un, unleashed on the world and on men. So, uh, so she, that became, you know, another whole line of argument she could make against the West was was this, you know, real Phyllis Schlafly type uh, attack on on women's lib. And help us think about what Moldodi wanted from Maryam. Well, that's you know one of the sort of things that I sort of withhold in the book, so I'm not going to say everything, but um, basically Maldudi's ideas um, grew out of, of the India's, um, you know, uh, trying to get rid of the British Empire, and, you know, he, grew, he was born in 1901, he, for a while he was, um, there was a kind of Muslim Hindu unity with, Ga under Gandhi and his, um, movement, but he gradually moved away from that and he began to articulate, and he was really the, one of the first people to articulate this idea of an Islamic state based entirely on Sharia law, and which, you know, we hear a lot about now, because especially, you know, with Egypt and, and um, you know, the Muslim Brotherhood, the Sayyid Qutb, who I mentioned, was deeply influenced by his writings on the idea of, a, of an Islamic constitution as was um, Ayatollah Khomeini, who uh, translated his works from Urdu into Persian for Iran. So Maududi was a voice of huge authority in this, not only in his part of the world, South Asia, but also in the Middle East. And um, you know, he was constantly going to Saudi Arabia. So, uh, King Saud was, was um, subsidizing and patronizing the Jamaat Islami his political party, which he had founded in India, which was the first, quote unquote, Islamic political party, and which continues to be a force in Pakistan. I mean, there are a lot of little Jamaati Islami offshoots, but basically these are the parties through which um, the, you know, jihadis are organized and, and sent off to, to fight, um, you know, either in the Northwest t Territories or, or in Afghanistan. 
So this is sort of the mo mother of all jihadi, and he wrote sort of the first book on global jihad. He sort of was the first to articulate what the what the um, the aims of global jihad was, and that was also kind of interesting to me because I there were there have been many many books about him and and his writings and biographies and everything, but none of them none of them mention. Mar Mar Margaret Marcus and Mariam Jamila. None of them talk about him as a father or a husband or a brother or a son. And Mariam's letters were all about his household and the way it was run. And you know, in that, there seemed to be a benefit in, in instead of looking at this man as this powerful Islamic political leader, which is how all the academic scholars have written about him, was to look at, at the politics of his household which were much more complicated and unexpected than you would assume, you know, given, given his writings. I mean, his, you know, Mariam would be upset because his wife didn't always, you know, wasn't always, you know, in strict perda, you know, and, you know, she would say, well, why, aren't, why didn't you, you know, wear your, um, per, why didn't you wear your, um, you know, veil when you went out to meet your, you know, brother-in-law, and she said, Oh, you know, d doesn't your husband, you know, get upset at that? And she said, "Oh, you know, my husband is such a saint. He has so much patience for me." <laughs> you know, but basically she would get away with like j the things that Madhuli was telling every proper Islamic woman she had to do and his own wife he he couldn't actually make live up to these ideas. The contradictions are manifest in the lives here, but also our own lives, and that's one of the nice mirroring aspects of the book is it kind of wedges us into looking at that and ourselves in a new way. I think that your comments also lead beautifully to the other passage we were speaking about reading today. Uh, which, that was the... Um, the family life. Oh, right. Okay, so this is, um, this is just one... Uh, uh, this is again also in July 1962 when she's still getting used to Pakistan and Modudi's household. Um, your exhaustive description of mother's birthday dinner at that fancy Westchester restaurant was well nigh unbearable to read. I'm still unaccustomed to the Pakistani diet and to hear of that rich menu of foods you are enjoying is a torment. When I'm most hungry, I have visions of steak and pot roast and meatloaf and mashed potatoes finished off with a thick slice of Sara Lee cheesecake and ice cream. The Maulana confided to me that he experienced similar visions of Begum Mabudi's dishes when he was being feted as an honored guest of King Saud in the tents of Saudi Arabia. On his yearly visit, he is expected to relish the sight of an entire roast camel. The hump is served as an appetizer. And as honored guest, he is presented with the platter of testicles and eyeballs. I expect I will soon grow used to the chilies and will find food tasteless without them. But until then, I dream of Sara Lee. Let's take a moment and see what questions are rising for the audience. I'm curious to know how the process of researching it and writing it and perhaps meeting her um, possibly changed your perceptions of people who, who convert, who, you know, or who go against the tide, uh, against values held by their family or community. I don't know if you had any feelings about that beforehand that maybe attracted you to this sort of subject, um, but I was just wondering how how you well, um, it it wasn't t you know t till I began like um, you know thinking deeply about you know wh why does this story resonate with me you know that I began looking at my own life and and the whole idea of conversion I'd never really given much thought to. Eventually, by the way, Mar Margaret's parents sort of sort of they didn't really convert, but they sort of left Judaism and became Unitarians. You know, and they didn't make a big fuss about it or anything. It was just you know they liked the community of people and you know they were very into assimilating and becoming more American um, and it didn't seem like a big deal for them you know their daughter was already going to the Unitarian Church but then like the more I thought about it I thought like I was raised Catholic by my mother and um, and you know 
I'd always sort of heard that my father, who had been raised Episcopal, had converted to Catholicism before he married my mother. And my mother said, yes, he converted, he wanted this big church wedding, and the next morning I got up, and you know, after our wedding, and I said, well, I, and he said, well, why are you getting up? And he goes, well, I'm, I'm, I'm going, we're going to church. And he goes, but we went to church yesterday. <laughs> but he, he became really obsessed with Catholicism, learning all the church history and doctrine and everything. And then all of a sudden, you know, he wasn't. And he wasn't so keen on it anymore. So he converted, but then he became hugely anti-Catholic. So when I, by the time I came along and my siblings came along, you know, going to church was this loaded, fraught thing. You know, there was like my father would be in a funk in the back and my mother would be dressing us all up and putting our hats on. And then when we'd come home for dinner, you know, he would launch into his sermon about the evils of the Catholic Church and the Pope's hypocrisies and all that stuff. So, you know, I was like, on the one hand, you know, I was like, you know, praying to Jesus and looking at him, you know, what kind of adoring and, you know, and then on the other hand, you know, I got all this stuff about the Pope. So I realized, you know, like, so here's like this argument. And, it, and also, you see it in our culture now, this sense of, you know, sort of secular humanism, agnosticism, you know, how, how um, close-minded it can be to, you know, um, that you know, the, the religion is always, you know, posed in terms of fanatics or fundamentalists or, you know, that's, you know, that's how we read, you know, we read about, you know, the, you know, brainwashing of children and, things like that, it's never, um, you know, it's never seen as a, a, it's rarely seen as a kind of positive thing or as a, as, a, as a power for good, you know, it's always, it's often framed as this kind of evil, fanatical thing, whether they're, you know, right wing. And as a result, of course, my own siblings, I, my, I have a brother who's, who I adore, who's an evangelical Christian, his wife believes in creationism. And you know, I have a sister who's a yogi, and another one who's a pagan slash Unitarian. So you know, we all obviously there is a desire for something, but um, you know that that secularism doesn't have all the answers for, especially for children. I think. Mm -hmm. Could you use the microphone, please? Thank you. Um, have there what other? I haven't read your other books. Have, what other? Um, blind zealots with massive contradictions have you been interested in? <clears throat> and have you ever thought of doing a book that groups many of these together to see what the pattern is? Well, I think, you know, people are so unpredictable, it's really hard to imagine, you know, that there'd be any consistent pattern. But, um, but I, I find that I'm drawn to people who are good with words, you know, because I feel like that gives me access to them in a way, you know, so there have been mostly, you know, poets, actually three poets um, that I've written about and before I got to marry them. And, and, you know, you get, you get insight, you know, directly into their souls through their, through their writings. And really that's what drew me to them, you know, more than the specificities of their religious beliefs which were often quite unpredictable. I have a question about this person that she lived with in Pakistan. Mm -hmm. How was the initial meeting uh, between them? He seemed so influential. Was her family that influential that they come, you know, combined and said, oh, you're going to go live with him or she? No, they had been corresponding for a year before she decided to go. And I think, you know, before she left, she decided to go, to leave America, to go into exile when her parents were off on holiday in the Caribbean. And I think she had a sense of how, how you know, that she was, had been mired in this sort of stuck in this place, you know, between her adolescence and adulthood. And she hadn't been able to move forward in her life. She said she was kicked out of college. She really had no way of making a living. and. Um, and, and he had been inviting her for over a year to come live with him. You know, so they'd been corresponding, she'd been asking him questions, he'd been giving her answers, she'd been writing essays, he'd been sending her essays. So it was a real sort of meeting of minds, which was, I mean, and the fact that she was a woman, the fact that she was raised Jew, you know, just did not seem to bother him at all. Um, and so she had, 
So he had this fantasy of her, and she had this fantasy of him. And you know, when she arrived, you know, it becomes apparent that they were both deeply disappointed in each other. He, he, she felt that part of the reason he was disappointed in her was because she wasn't like what he imagined an American woman looked like. She, she didn't, well, she wasn't blonde. She didn't have blue hair. She wasn't tall and slim. You know, she, she looked actually not too much different from his own daughters, you know. Thank you so much for joining us well, today. There's one more question. I, I think, oh, we have to. Oh, oh, okay. oh, yes, so welcome to ask later. <laughs> It's been lovely. Thank you for your patient listening. You're watching 48 hours of nonfiction authors and books on C-SPAN 2's Book TV.